to all the moms. Moms of children who are still at home or all grown up. Moms who've outlived a son or daughter or moms of babies they never got to hold. Moms who've raised kids all on their own or became a mom to someone who needed one. Moms of children who have wandered from God or the longing to be moms who are still waiting. God perfectly arranged each of you into the role you have today. His word recognizes you as capable, strong, and praiseworthy. Everything you do makes our lives more beautiful. Happy Mother's Day. Good morning. Would you stand to your feet this morning? I heard somebody say, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. Will you find somebody you haven't been able to talk to this morning and tell them Happy Mother's Day? All right, you may have a seat. Well, good morning. Well, good morning. Sorry, nobody was paying attention the first time, but I'm glad that you're here. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms, the stepmoms, grandmothers, great grandmothers, moms yet to be, and to all who have lost their mom. We can all agree that moms are a special, unique gift that God gives us, and I know that we're thankful for all the moms that are in our lives. So often we understand God's love in masculine terms, like God is brave, God is strong, God is powerful, but Scripture talks about the love of God in feminine terms as well. Psalm 91, 1 through 4 says that the one who lives under the protection of the Most High dwells in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say concerning the Lord, who is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, He Himself will rescue you from the bird trap, from the destructive plague. And then verse 4 says, He will cover you with His feathers. You will take refuge under His wings. His faithfulness will be a protective shield. So just as a mother hen gathers her chicks under her feathers, so our mothers gather us under her feathers and love us so well, and they reflect God's love in that way. So happy Mother's Day to all the moms, spiritual moms, foster moms, adoptive moms, any way that you are a mom or moms yet to be. We're thankful for you today, and I pray that as we honor you today, that we'll be reminded of the way that God loves us and the way that God protects us just as moms do. So I have a couple of announcements this morning. We have baby dedication next Sunday, so if you have a child that you would like to dedicate, please fill out one of those forms and turn it in today. Every year we like to get a small gift for that child, and we need that form today so we can be sure that that gift comes in on time. You can get a form from the back hallway. You can talk to me. You can talk to Brother Jeremy. But please get those in. We would hate to miss somebody, and we'd love to, to honor you and your child and dedicate to both of you. So our pictorial directory, yesterday was our first day of pictures. Everything went really smooth in case you got confused. All pictures are going to be in the nursery wing of the children's building next Saturday. It is super important that you're a part of this. We haven't done a pictorial directory since 2015. That's been a long time ago. We may not do another one until 2035. So make sure that you are in this one. We want you to be a part. We want your family to be a part. So if you have not signed up to be a part of that yet, it's really easy. You can come talk to me. You can go talk to Miss Shelley in the back of the foyer after service today. Pictures take less than five minutes. You go in, go to the nursery. It's the last room on the right. It's super easy. All you have to do is sign up, show up, dress up. They make sure you don't look weird in your picture, and it's super easy. There's no hard sell for you to buy pictures. You take your picture. They say, see you later. You can go back to what you're doing. But if you want to buy some pictures, they send you an email with the email that you registered with. If you want to buy some, it's that easy. But there's no hard sell, no pressure. So just come get your picture taken and be a part of that directory. VBS registration is kicked off. If you want to be part of VBS, I hope that you do. VBS is at night from 6 to 8.30, so if you work during the day, you can serve. Be sure to sign your kids up 
And on June the 4th, we're going to do something new. It's going to be a VBS kickoff. If you've ever been to Century Kid before or you've ever taken your kids to Century Kid before, we're going to have our very own Organized Mass Chaos OMC as a kickoff for VBS. If you don't know what that is, it involves shaving cream, water balloons, and a lot of hula hoops. And you may even get your own water gun if you come. So be sure to sign your kids up for that and be a part. More details will come the closer that we get. We have Helping Hands next Saturday on May the 20th. We still need plenty of help to serve, to donate food, to help cook. If you can help in any way, this is a great way to live sent. There's no better way to live sent than to, to volunteer your time at Salvation Army. We have Brotherhood Breakfast on May the 21st. We have a Journey Camp Parent Meeting on May the 24th at 6 o'clock. That's going to be all our waivers, all our forms. I'm going to tell you what your kids cannot bring to camp, all that kind of stuff. I need you to be there. If you or your kid is going to Journey Camp, that is a mandatory meeting. And if you want to save some time, bring a copy of your insurance card as well. Journey Camp money is due on May the 28th. That's two weeks from today. That's 300 bucks a piece. Kindergarten and college recognition is going to be on June the 4th. If you have a kindergarten graduate or a college graduate, be sure to fill out one of those forms on the back table in the foyer. Fill one of those out hand those back to me. And be reminded that our May month of giving is going to the Baptist Children's Village. So I know that was a lot of announcements, but I hope that you're excited to worship today. Happy Mother's Day. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we continue with our service this morning. Father, we're thankful for today. Lord, we're thankful for our moms, thankful for all the, the mom figures in our life. Lord, the spiritual moms, the, the adoptive moms, foster moms. Lord, whoever has been a mom in our life, Lord, we're thankful. And we're thankful for the gift of motherhood that you've given us, Lord, for the, the moms that are yet to be, the moms that are soon to be, and the moms that already are. Lord, we are thankful for the blessings that you give us. Lord, I pray that you would bless our service today, that you would remind us of the way that you love us, how you gather us under your wings, and Lord, that you will be honored and you will be praised today. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Well, what a great day, just as Brother Hunter said, what a great day to be in the Lord's house. And so we are so thankful that you are here. And I would also like to be one to say Happy Mother's Day to our moms here. Um, I'm so thankful for my mom and for each of our moms, for our, um, who they are and what they mean in our lives, for those who are here with us today, and to those who have gone on to be with the Lord and Savior. Um, for all the mother figures that we've had in our lives, there are so many ladies that are even sitting in this room today that have been a role model and an example set before me and so many of us as we've grown. And so we're so thankful to all of our moms and all of our mother figures in our lives. And so um, what a joy it is that we can celebrate you today. So let's all stand together as we begin our time of worship together. We build our lives on the firm foundation that we find only in Christ Jesus. And so let's lift this up today, the solid rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not
pray that all of our foundations are built upon Christ alone. Now, we're going to do something a little special here, but what I'm going to ask is all of our children, maybe high school down, all of our um, youth and children, if you would, I want you guys to sing this first song for us. That you could hear maybe some of the children around you singing this morning and what a joy it is to hear these precious children singing the truths of God and you know it's such a simple truth but it's so true at the same time Jesus truly does love us so much so that he was willing to give his life for each and every one of us let's join in on this simple song Jesus loves me Jesus loves me he who singing this morning so the lyrics of the song called the blessing are a beautiful expression of both love and appreciation for mothers on mother's day the words remind us that no matter what god always will be with us providing guidance grace and protection to our families it is also a beautiful reminder of the unconditional love that mothers have for their children and also the love that God has for each and every one of us. And this morning, I hope and pray that this song, The Blessing, can be our prayer over each and every one of your lives, over your family, over your children, and over our generations to come after us.
that His blessings will continue in the lives of each of your families and in your homes. May His favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family, in your children, in their children, in their children. May His favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family, in your children, in their children. Lift it up this morning. May His favor be upon so that God's blessings are poured out over his people today. You may be seated. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, that you have blessed us. And Father, I pray that everyone in this room would understand that we don't deserve a single ounce of your grace and your goodness in our lives, and yet you give it to us, and yet you've pursued us, and yet you extend to us the free gift of salvation. Father, not because you have to, because you want to, because you love us, because you want to bless us, you want us to to be a part of your family. And God, I pray everyone in this room is an adopted son or daughter and is a part of your family. God, I pray that anyone in this room who has not received that free gift would do so before they leave these doors. But God, we thank you for blessing us. God, we thank you for blessing us with, with mothers. God, we thank you for blessing us with this church here at Fredonia Baptist Church. And God, we we, we thank you, and we, we thank you for the blessing that is found in your word. And God, I pray now as we transition to study it, God, that we would do that. God, that we would take this time seriously to see what it is that you want us to see. And God, to apply the things that you would want us to apply to our lives, God, so that we can, we can be changed, we can be transformed, we can live sin and be the people that you call us to be in every season, in every situation of life. And so, God, we pray that your spirit would just be poured out. And this morning, God, we know that you're here. And, God, we're praying that you would speak into our lives in whatever way we need. And I'm asking all of this in the power of Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and grab your Bibles. If you don't have one, then there'll be one right in front of you. We'd love for you to grab one of those. But grab your Bible. I want you to turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. We will be... Looking at other places, but we'll begin there, John chapter 14, so I'm going to ask for you to turn there. But have you ever been lost? Of course, we all have, right? You ever been in a situation where 
you didn't know what to do. Or, or maybe you didn't know which direction to go. I, I can think of several instances where, where I was lost, one of which uh, I remember I'm a deer hunter, and so I deer hunted one uh, afternoon. I hunt on public land, and I went to a spot that I was not familiar with. It was a remote spot, and um, just thought that I would go there that, that evening, thought I could make my way back out. You can probably uh, guess that I did not make my way back out, not, not easily at least. I missed the trail that I was supposed to go out on. Uh, I thought I was going in the right direction. Turns out I was going in the opposite direction. Uh, my flashlight went out on me. This was during the time. Uh, and you, you may not know about this time, but there was a time when we couldn't pull up our phones and, and look at the GPS and say, oh, I'm actually going the wrong way. I need to go this way. It was before all of that. And so thankfully, I did have enough uh, power on my phone to call my dad, and he was able to walk me out. And I, about two hours later, was able to get back to my truck. It was a long, uh, painful experience. But a lot of Christians, right, a lot of Christians... We try to navigate the Christian life on our own, don't we? We try to figure it out on our own, and we end up, as a result of that, getting lost, getting turned around, getting disoriented, not knowing which way or which direction we ought to go. And the truth of the matter is that we need help. All of us needed to admit that, that, that we need help. We live in a hostile unbelieving world. More and more, as the time goes on, we are living in those types of days. And the Christian life is difficult. Can we just admit that? It's difficult. The Christian life, it's, it can be disheartening at times. It can be hard, right? But God never intended for His children to, to figure out things and figure out this navigation of this hostile, unbelieving world by ourselves. And he has given us a helper. He has given us a counselor to walk alongside us every step of the way. And the point I want to make to you this morning is that we need to start relying upon him more and start relying on ourselves less. We're in a series titled Belief, What We Believe. And, and over the past several weeks in this study, what we've been looking at in, in a very specific way is the Holy Spirit. Now, we've been talking for several weeks now about the Holy Spirit. We've discovered a couple of things already. We've discovered that the Holy Spirit is not a divine force, but that He is a divine person, the personhood of the Holy Spirit. He's real. We've also discovered that the Holy Spirit is active. He's busy in the world. We talked about last time how He's busy convicting unbelievers of their sin, drawing them to receive forgiveness of their sin, which, by the way, can only be found in the cross and only through professing Christ as Savior and Lord. And so today I want to build off of that. I want to give you another layer of who the Holy Spirit is. And I want our time this morning to be less focused on the life of an unbeliever. We talked about that last time. And today, I want us to be talking about his role in the life of a believer. Okay, what I mean by that is this, that if you are a born-again believer, if you have been saved and have experienced the transformative power of the gospel, then why are you given the Holy Spirit? What is his role? What does his activity look like in your life? So I want to answer those questions. I want us to begin our time today by looking at the passage I've asked you to turn to, John chapter 14. And I want you to look beginning in verse 16. We'll actually just look there to start. Verse 16, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he says this, he says, And I will ask the Father... And he will give you another, underline this word if you're one to do that, counselor to be with you forever. Now again, I want to emphasize to you the word counselor because in the original language, the language in which it was written, it is one of those rich, complex, multi-layered words. Parakletos. Parakletos. That's the, that's the Greek word for the word counselor. Counselor. Para means to call alongside of. And then the last part of that word, kaletos, means to call on. 
Okay, and so in a literal sense, parakaletos means to call alongside someone else or to, to stand with someone else. In the ancient culture, it was a term that was oftentimes used in the law courts of the council for defense. A parakaletos meant that someone would stand next to and plead someone's case before the judge. They were, as the Christian Standard Bible translates this word, the translation I'm going to use today, a counselor. Or if you have the King James Version, your, your version is going to say a comforter. Or if you have the New International Version, your version says an advocate. Or if you have the English Standard Version, your version says a helper. And this is what the Holy Spirit is for the believer. He is a counselor. He is a comforter. He is an advocate. He is a helper. Now, before we move on from here, I, I want to note to you a couple of things in regards to this verse in John chapter 14, verse 16. First, I want you to notice that Jesus does not say believers will receive counsel, but that he will receive, we will receive a counselor. Okay, and you say big deal, right? Big deal. You're splitting hairs, Jeremy. Don't, don't go down that rabbit hole. We don't have time for that. It's the same thing. I would argue to you, to you, though, it's not the same thing. We aren't just given help. We're given what? A helper. We're not just given counsel. We're given what? A counselor. Remember, the Holy Spirit is a person and the helper, the counselor, dwells, lives inside the believer and he personally directs and he personally guides their life. For example, imagine trying to, to navigate a big city and you end up getting lost and turned around. Would you rather have directions or a guide? Would you rather have directions or a guide? Would you rather have someone say, okay, take a left, take a right, go up the hill, go down the hill, cross the bridge, cross the river, go across this, stop at that light, and then take a left at this light, and then you'll arrive at your intended destination. Would you, would you rather have that, or, or would you rather have someone say, tell you what, I've got time. Uh, uh, I'll take you there personally. I'll be your personal guide. Guys, I don't know about you, but I'm taking that second option every day. And you see, that's what we have. That's what we've been given in the Holy Spirit. As believers, he, he dwells inside of us, and he is our personal counselor and personal helper and personal guide. And something else you ought you to note about the Holy Spirit here that it talks about in this verse is that he will provide you help and counsel 24-7, seven, seven days a week. Notice again, verse 16, Jesus says, He will be with you for how long? Forever. He will be with you forever. That means that the Holy Spirit doesn't take any days off. That means the Holy Spirit doesn't work a 9-to-5 job and says, Hey, I'm done. I'll come see you again when I get a good night's sleep. No, he dwells. He, he lives inside of you forever, and he doesn't take any days off. He works 24-7. You have, look, think about it like this. You have 24-hour roadside assistance in your walk with God. I mean, he is with you every step of the way. Once you receive him, he never leaves you. He never forsakes you. He never abandons you. And he is always there to assist you and help you and guide you and provide you wisdom, discernment, counsel in every area, every season of life, 24-7, seven days a week, 365 days out of the year. All right, so generally speaking, that's, that's the Holy Spirit. That's what he does. But, but I want, as I alluded to earlier, I want us to get a little closer up. Right, that's 10,000 feet. Let's, let's get down, let's, let's have a closer view based upon God's word of the Holy Spirit's role in his ministry in the life of the believer. The specific things. Right, again, the question is, what exactly does the Holy Spirit do in a believer's life. When we get saved, when we receive him, what specific activities does he stay busy with? 
All right, well, there are many, and it's going to serve as our outline today, several specific things that he does in our lives as believers. And the first one is this, truth about God. The Holy Spirit helps us with the truth about God. Look at verse 25 and 26, same chapter, John chapter 14. Jesus says, I have spoken these things to you while I remain with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, here it is, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. That was to the disciples and to believers too. Now turn to chapter 16, just a couple of pages perhaps in your Bible over. Chapter 16, and look at what is said in verses 12 through 13. Jesus is again speaking here, and he says this. He says, I still have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. Now listen to this. When the Spirit of truth, that is a title given to the Holy Spirit, one of the titles he has, Spirit of truth, when he comes, he will guide you into what? All the truth. Truth, for he will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears, and he will also declare to you what is to come. Now, to me, that answers a question that I have had before. I would imagine at some point you have probably had this question, and that is this. The question is this. How were the disciples who didn't have formal education who didn't understand a lot of what was going on in Jesus' ministry and his teachings, who who oftentimes would just kind of miss the point altogether, how were the disciples able to write the four books of the gospel? How were they able to do that? Well, I can tell you this much. It wasn't because they were smart enough, right? It wasn't because they had this brilliant mind, right? Right? It was only through the inspiration, the power of the Holy Spirit that they were able to remember and understand and record the the details and the intricacies and the events of the gospel as they wrote them out. Right? The Holy Spirit, it gave them that knowledge. The Holy Spirit gave them that understanding. The Holy Spirit gave them that truth because John 16, 13 says, The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth, and He will guide you into all the truth. And speaking of that word truth, it's important for you to understand that we're not talking about some generic truth. Okay? Uh, For example, the role of the Holy Spirit, this may upset some of you students, but the role of the Holy Spirit is not to teach you how to solve a math problem, okay? That that role is reserved for your math teacher. The, The truth we're talking about here is spiritual truth. He's not your math teacher. He's your spiritual teacher. He teaches you and reveals to you spiritual truth concerning Christ, concerning his church, concerning scripture, and so on and so forth for the Christian life. For example, if you've studied God's word long enough, then I bet this has happened to you at some point. You read a passage of scripture, right? You've read this passage multiple times. Perhaps you've read this passage dozens of times. You've heard it preached before. But then suddenly you read that passage and it's like an aha moment. It's like an epiphany. And and you come to realize something about that verse that you had never seen before. It was always there, but now you see it, right? Have you ever had something like that happen to you, right? It happens to me all the time. Right? I, have, I have a general understanding of a teaching of Scripture, but the more I read it and study it and meditate on it, the, the deeper my understanding of it grows and I discover something new that I wasn't aware of before. Now, how does all that work, right? How do, you say, yeah, I know what you're talking about, but, but how does that work? Well, well, it's called spiritual illumination. Spiritual illumination. It's where, it's where, the Holy Spirit shines the light on something that is already bright, but He shines on it even brighter so that you can see it better, 
so that you can understand it better. When, you, when we read and when we study our Bibles, the Holy Spirit helps us with the truth about God. It's amazing. It's amazing. That's one of his roles. Now, secondly, the Holy Spirit, another thing he does is he helps us with our testimony for God. Our testimony for God. Look now at John chapter 15. John chapter 15, look at verses 26 through 27. Jesus says, when the counselor comes, the one I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. And now listen to this. You also will testify because you have been with me from the beginning. Now, follow the train of thought. Okay, Follow this train of thought being presented here. What Jesus says is this. Jesus says it's the job of the Holy Spirit to teach us truth, right? To tell us and teach us and testify to us who Jesus is, what his word says. And then with that truth and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us, we are to testify and we are to be a gospel witness to an unbelieving world. Do you understand the, the train of thought here? Basically, it's this. What God pours into us through the Holy Spirit, God wants to pour out of us through the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, we understand the truth and through the Holy Spirit, we proclaim that truth to a lost world. The, the Holy Spirit helps us in that type of way. For example, consider, consider the marching orders that, that Jesus gave his disciples as he resurrected from the grave. Right? We know that today as the Great Commission, right? The Great Commission, the command that Jesus gives all believers, and he says to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every nation, tongue, and tribe. Right? You know that. But, but do you remember what Jesus said to his disciples right after he gives that instruction? He, he gives that and says, go. And then in Acts chapter 1, we read that he says, wait in Jerusalem. Right? That doesn't make a lot of sense because Jesus says, go, go and do this. And then he says, but, but wait, before you go, wait, before you go into the world, before you testify about me, wait to be filled with the Holy Spirit for when he comes, he will be your counselor, your teacher, your helper, your advocate, your guide as you go into Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth to tell others about me. Now, if you are a believer here this morning, then in some ways, in some ways, this ought to be just kind of just a sigh of relief. You read, you read that, you understand, and you're like, okay, good, good. Because you know, right, you know you are to be a witness of God. You understand that, right? You understand the command. I am called to be a witness of God. I am called to, to live a life of testimony for God. But you begin to compare yourself, right, to the people we read about in the Bible. And, and, and you say things like this. I'm no Peter. I'm no Paul. I, I don't know what to say. I, I'm going to blunder over my words. I'm going to mess it up. I feel under qualified to fulfill this great task, this great mission to go and share the gospel with the lost. You ever felt that way? Well, if you have, join the club, okay? Because I, I feel that way all the time. Okay, all the time throughout my, my years in serving the Lord, I have thought that plenty of times. I'm not worthy. I'm unqualified. I can't do it. But did you know, did you know that Peter publicly denied the Lord Jesus Christ. Not once, not twice, three times. He, he messed it up, and then just a few chapters later, he preaches a powerful sermon, and 3,000 people get saved. you got to ask yourself the question, well, what got into Peter? Or what happened to Peter? Well, I'll tell you what happened to Peter. The Holy Spirit happened to Peter. That's what happened to Peter, Right? And think about Paul. Think about much of his early life, what it was spent doing. What did Paul enjoy doing before Christ? 
hunting down, persecuting Christians. That's what he was driven to do. And yet when the Lord got a hold of him, he used Paul in mighty ways and led many people to the Lord through his life. And how'd that happen? How did that kind of transformative, powerful work happen through the power of the Spirit? That's how it happened. See, the point, the point is this. People aren't saved through perfect, polished lives. And praise God they're not because I'm not perfect and polished, are you? I'm unworthy. I'm unqualified. I can't do it. And you're right, I can't do it. I need help, and I have been given, you have been given, the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you're a believer, that same Spirit we just talked about, well, it lives inside of you, and God wants to use you despite your flaws and despite your failures and despite your imperfections to draw people and point people to Him. To Him. And not only that, but the Holy Spirit helps us in a third way. In a third way, in talking to God, he helps us. Talking to God. Turn with me to, to Romans chapter 8. I told you we're going to be looking around different places today. Romans chapter 8. Give you a moment to turn there. Romans chapter 8. And look at what it says in verses 26 through 27. Romans chapter 8. It says, in the same way, here it is, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness because we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because He intercedes for the saints, that's you and me, according to the will of God. Now, notice the word helps. Okay, you see it in verse 26. Right? Verse 26, you see it there? In the context of this verse, that word helps. What it means is, is to help someone carry a burden or, or help someone carry a load that they, they cannot do it on their own. They're too weak to do it on their own. And that's what the Holy Spirit does for the believer. Okay? Yes, you are an adopted son or daughter of God if you place your faith in Christ. If you place your faith in Christ, then your salvation is secure. But because we still live in a fallen world, because we are still in our sinful human state, on our own, we are still spiritually weak. And so the Holy Spirit comes alongside of us and lives in us and dwells in us in order to help us in those areas of weakness. Now, in this passage, Paul is he's pointing out a certain weakness, right? We, we have many, okay? And here, he's pointing out one of those, and that is our weakness in talking to God. Okay, not that we can't pray, it's just we don't know always what to pray for, right? We, 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 we don't always know what is God's will in this situation. What should I be specifically praying for? We, in our weakness, we don't always know. What that is, for example, say someone you know is, is deathly ill and is seriously sick, right? And you're, you're made aware of it. And so, as you should, as you should, you pray to God, right? Asking uh, God to deliver them of their sickness and to experience healness and be, be able to, to get back up on their feet. Again, that's how you pray. And, and you should pray in that way. And God might do that. Right? God might do that. He certainly has the power to do that and to grant that. Right? That could be God's will. But it could also be that God's will in that situation is to bring that believer home to him in heaven and that he wants to use their passing to draw others to him, to grow others in their faith and in their dependence on him. We don't know, right? We don't know. What, whatever the situation may be, the point is this. The, the point is that there are situations in life where we don't know what we should pray for. And, and we don't know what God's will is, but the Spirit does know what we should pray for. And the Spirit does know what God's will is. And so He intercedes on our behalf to the Father. 
That's amazing. I mean, when I, when, I, when I study this teaching, I'm just blown away that the Holy Spirit does that. That you might be praying for something that you're like, God, I, I, I need this, I need this, I need this, but you don't actually need that, right? And so the Spirit says, uh, let me intercede here. Let me step in here. Let me redirect that prayer to the Father that is in accordance to His will. For example, I, I can tell you this. I did not pray to become your pastor. I didn't pray to, to become a pastor, period. Period. In fact, when I felt called, first called to the ministry, you know when I prayed, God, anything but that. <laughs> anything but that and I ran from that calling but the spirit interceded on my behalf and he brought me into God's will even when I was running away even when I wasn't praying that and I'm so glad that he did because in my weakness and in your weakness we don't always know what to pray for we don't always know what God's will is but the Holy Spirit does and he helps us with talking to God and he helps us to stay in line with God's will and God's plan and God's purposes for our lives and he helps us counsels us in those ways so you tracking this morning you tracking the holy spirit helps us with truth about god testimony for god talking with god here's a fourth one the holy spirit helps us with togetherness in god togetherness in god i want you to turn now to another place of scripture you're in bible drill right Shows you the importance of Bible drill. But 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Turn with me there. And as you're turning there, I'll give you some context just to, to be succinct here. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, what Paul is doing is he's honing in about the unity that should be found in the church. In essence, he's saying there's diversity. There's diversity in our gifts, but there's one spirit and so we are to be united. We are to be united, one spirit, and in Christ. So, with that in mind, look at what it says beginning in verse 11. Paul says, here it is, one, one version of it here, one and the same spirit is active in all of these, distributing to each person as he wills, for just as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of that body, though many are one body, so also is Christ. For we were all baptized by what? One spirit into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether sl slaves or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. So here's the deal. Here is the deal. Just because, just because we know the truth about God, and just because we have a testimony for God, and just because we can speak to God, does it necessarily mean we're going to see eye to eye on every little thing and agree with every decision that is made in the context of the church? That's what it means. That's the deal. Okay, and we see it all throughout Scripture even. All throughout Scripture, we see it play out. I'll give you two. Galatians chapter 2, Paul confronts Peter. Uh, about an issue concerning law versus grace, and they, they kind of get into it. They have a disagreement. They have a little bit of a falling out there. Acts chapter 15 is another one. Paul and Barnabas, that they get into this dispute whether or not they should take John Mark uh, on a missionary journey. And so one thinks this, one thinks that, and there's this, there's this tension, right? So, so this, is, this is not something that's new, right? We, we see it ever since the formation of the New Testament church, that there's disagreements, and people don't always see eye to eye on things. But with that being said, what 1 Corinthians 12 teaches is that despite our disagreements on certain things, we are to be united as a body of believers under one spirit. Okay, what that means is that while we may have different beliefs about how we should do things and how we should operate as a church, I would call them secondary things. What we all have the same belief in is primary things, that Jesus is our Savior and Lord. We, we all understand that this is His church. We are His members of His church. We all have this understanding that we have all been adopted into God's family, meaning that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. 
And so, yes, we may look different from each other. Yes, we may come from different backgrounds. Yes, we may have different levels of education. Yes, we may have different ideas and views on lesser secondary things. But those differences should not drive us apart. Those differences don't make someone less of a Christian. No, Paul says we are all united in Christ. He is saying we are all one in Christ because we've all been rescued from the same hell by the same Savior. We've all been given the same Spirit. We've all been adopted into God's family. And that is enough reason for us to get along and have unity and harmony with one another despite our diversity and despite our differences. So that's what it means. That, that's what, to have unity in the Spirit, that is what it means. Jesus prayed to, for, for the church, uppercase church, the whole, all, all the church. John chapter 17, this is what he said. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you so that the world may believe you sent me. In other words, when the, when the world sees a bunch of people who are different in so many ways, when the world sees that bunch of people, the church, still loving each other and caring for each other and encouraging each other and serving, when they see that, they take notice. And they say, I don't have that, but I want to be a part of it. I'm attracted to that. Right? When the unbelieving world sees the church being united in spirit, in faith, it, it validates our faith. It makes our faith to the unbeliever, to the skeptic, credible. So there's something there because that's not normal. That's not normal. And so it is a testimony. Our togetherness in the spirit is a testimony and a witness for the unbeliever to join in and to believe the same things that we believe in and to experience the same transformative power that we have experienced in our lives. So that's the fourth. And lastly, fifth and finally, people are like, yes. Fifth and finally, one more, hang with me. Hang with me. This one's important. I want you to see it. The Holy Spirit helps us with transference to God. Transference to God. You're, you say, what do you mean? Well, the Holy Spirit helps us get from here to there. Okay? The, the Holy Spirit it guarantees, it's a, it's a guarantee that one day we'll go from living on this earth to being in the presence of our Lord. In heaven. Okay, let me show you. Turn in your Bible one last time, and then we're going to wrap this thing up. But turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Look there real quick. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14. Okay, this is what it says. Look closely. Paul says... In him, okay, him is Jesus, right? You also were, look at this, sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. Now look at verse 14. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. Now, that passage is speaking about primarily two things. Two things. Ownership and security. Okay? Ownership and security. Let me, let me explain through an illustration, okay? This is a true illustration because in ancient times, when you had someone like a king or, or someone of a, of a noble family, when they, when they might travel... And when they might, might get to a trading port and do trading and, and purchasing and buying, what they would use when that happened is they would use a signet ring. Okay? A signet. It was a ring that you wore, and it had on it uh, maybe your family's crest or some just unique thing that identified that as, as you. It was, it was, there was no other one like it, right? And so they would go to trading ports, and they would, uh, after they, they purchased uh, some, some item, some treasure, some good, they would press that ring into a seal, okay? They would, they would just press it in like this. The seal would have been made of, of, of uh, wax 
or clay so that the impression would stick. And that impression, as I alluded to, it represented that the king had bought that item and that it was off limits. No one else could get it because the, the king said, that's mine. Okay? And so that purchased item, it, it might go as it's getting its way back to wherever the king lived. It might go to this port and then go to that port and then this port and that port. But when it finally makes its way to the port of the king or whoever's purchasing it, purchasing it that king, that person will be there. And he's going to look at that seal and say, ah, that's my impression. Right? That's, that's my seal. That belongs to me. And he takes it, and it's his. You see where this is going? Because in a similar way, that's what Paul is saying about the believer in Ephesians chapter 1. He is saying if you have placed your faith in Christ, then you have received the Holy Spirit. And because you've received the Holy Spirit, you have been sealed. You've been sealed by God. You have been purchased purchased through the blood of Christ on the cross. And now no one can take you away from him. That is why Jesus declares, by the way, in John 10, 28, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. They are mine. That is my seal. And then notice what verse 14 says again. It's so good. I, I want to just make sure you see it says the Holy Spirit is the, my, my translation says, the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. Okay, what, what that means is this. The Holy Spirit is the first, if you will, the first payment. Right? The first installment of the glory that we're promised in heaven. Basically, it's this. It's a guarantee there's more to come. This is good. This is great. This is, thank you, God. But man, there is so much more that I'm going to get. Right? One day, one day, if you are in Christ, if you have received the Spirit, if you have been sealed in the Spirit, one day you're going to be in heaven. And one day you're going to be in glory. And one day you're going to reunite with your loved ones that you miss so much on this side of heaven. And one day you're going to be in the presence of the Father. And one day you're going to receive your eternal glorified heavenly body. And the Holy Spirit seals us up in those promises made by God. And it acts as the down payment, the first installment for what is to come for the believer. So, let me ask you, as we close, as we conclude, a couple of questions. Question one, have you trusted in Christ? Are you sealed? Are you sealed? Are you, have you been purchased and confessed and believed and embraced those things? Are you sealed with the Holy Spirit? Do, do you know with 100% confidence and certainty that you have repented of your sins, that you have trusted in Christ and have invited him into his life where in which you received his Holy Spirit? Such an important question. If you have been tuning me out, please don't now. And understand the question, because the question is, is not, do you faithfully attend church? And the question is not, did you bring your Bible to church? And the question is not, are you, do you try to be a good person and try to do the right thing? And the question is not even, do you know who Jesus is? The question that I am asking is, have you come to the end of yourself? Have you admitted that you are a sinner in need of a Savior? And have you placed your faith in Christ? I'm asking this morning, have you received the power of the Holy Spirit? Where the Holy Spirit, there's evidence of it in your life. The Holy Spirit is your counselor, and He is your advocate, and He helps you with truth about God, and testimony for God, and talking with God, and togetherness in God, and transference to God. The question is, do you see evidence of those things in your life? Or have you realized today, maybe perhaps the very first time, I don't have that. I don't have that. I, I'm missing that in my life. Would you pray and would you bow your heads with me as we go to the Lord at a time of prayer? 
And if you have come to the conclusion today that you have not personally, personally accepted Christ as your Savior and Lord, and you've not received the power of the Holy Spirit that we've talked about, I want you to know that, that you can receive those things right now. Right? That's, that is the beauty of the gospel. You say, I, I need to, I, I'm not ready. I need to clean my life up. God will meet you right there. And he will embrace you in open arms. Listen, if, you, if your heart, I don't know, if, you're, if your heart, though, is, if it's beating out of your chest right now and, and you're, you're pacing in your, in your pew, then perhaps, perhaps that is the Spirit of God convicting you of your sin and he's drawing you to him he is extending to you the free gift of salvation and say it's yours i've already paid for it all i've paid for it would you receive it would you embrace it can i just say to the person who has resisted that up to this point stop it stop resisting the greatest gift that you could ever receive but embrace that. Finally embrace that. Finally invite Christ into your life and you'll receive these things. The Bible is a simple message at its core. The gospel is it's simplistic when you really consider the pure message of it. All you have to do is just admit that, that you are a sinner, that you are far from God, that you have run from God, that you have disobeyed God that you've not lived the life that you know He's called you to live, and you're in rebellion. You're in separation of Him. Just admit that. Finally admit, yes, it's true. I am. And admit that you're a sinner. And then believe. Just believe that Jesus, He did do the things that He said He would do. He did die on the cross for the full and final payment of your sin. He did live the life that you could never live. And he died the death that you deserve to die. Also, that you could be a part of God's family and be saved. Do you believe those things? If you haven't believed those things, would you believe those things, embrace those things? And then lastly, you just confess. You confess, Jesus, you are my Savior. Jesus, you are the Lord of my life. I no longer live for myself, but I live for you to serve you because you've rescued me. You've rescued me from the very pit of hell, and I give my life to you. If you've not had that conversation with God, but you feel as if the Holy Spirit is, he is, he is pressing in on that, then would you stop resisting it, and would you embrace that, and would you invite him in your life in those ways? Do that right now. You can do it right now. Pray those things. Father, we thank you for paying it all on a rugged cross on the hill of Cal Calvary that you took the punishment of our sins and you paid the, death, the debt that we deserve to pay. You took the wrath of God so that we would never have to experience it. You were separated for God so that we would never have to be separated from him. But Father, help everyone in this room to understand that we don't get that through religion and we don't get that from just an understanding of it. We get that from embracing that and inviting those things, those truths in our lives. And so Holy Spirit, you're real. We know you're real. We know you're here. And we pray that you would work in the lives of an unbeliever, of a believer who is far from you right now, that they would come back. Or maybe just to strengthen the faith of those who are your children. God, would you move in this place as we close? And Father, if there's any decision that we need to make, when we do that right now, and may we publicly demonstrate that if need be up front. God, I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we close? I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thy all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed in white as snow. 
Mother's Day. I know it's been said, um, but I haven't said it to you yet, so happy Mother's Day. Uh, I hope you have a great day. I know there's a lot of guests with us this morning. We want to thank you for joining us. hope you'll have a great time celebrating and just enjoying each other as a family. It is truly a gift, so take advantage of that. hope you've been blessed this morning. hope you've been challenged and encouraged as I have in God's Word and study of it and proclaiming who He is through song. And so thank you so much for being here today. James Randall, would you close us out? And we'll be dismissed this morning. Thank you all for coming.